Yeah. They, they contain what? Uh, plastic bags, rope, tape, uh, knife, gun. Mm -hmm. All those wouldn't be in the kit. They'd be where I could have them in the house and gather them up. In Wichita, Kansas, an elusive serial killer went on a murdering spree for 30 years while evading police. He enjoyed taunting the press and the police by leaving letters. In his first letter, he would go on to describe his motto, bind them, torture them, and kill. Watch to see how he brutally murdered 10 people and almost got away with it if it wasn't for this unbelievably smart trick that helped the police capture him in the end. This is the story of the BTK Killer. On January 15, 1974, Joseph Otero, Julie Otero, and their two children were bound, tortured, and killed in broad daylight in their own home. The daughter was found hanging from a water pipe in the basement. The bodies were later discovered by the family's eldest child, Charlie, who had returned from school. Later that year, the police had suspects in custody, but the television station KAKE received a phone call directing them to the public library, and in a book they found the first letter from the killer. He went on to describe the details of the murders in accurate and gruesome detail, and made a promise that there would be more victims. In early 1978, the killer sent more letters to the television station KAKE in Wichita, confessing to the murders of the Oteros, Catherine Bright, Shirley Vian, and Nancy Fox. That's when he signed those letters with the nickname BTK, Bind, Torture, and Kill. He demanded and craved attention from the general public. He wanted to be the serial killer that haunted the city of Wichita. He went on to claim in his letters that he was forced to kill by a Factor X that drove him to commit those murders. A supernatural and almost demon-like force had possessed his body and took the driver's seat. Something that's, I use it, uh, I actually think I'm maybe possessed with demons. Uh, I was dropped on my head when I was a kid. Uh, I've talked to some uh, theological Christian people and some of those people are really strong. They actually think, well, the Bible says that, that there's demons and, and, uh, within you or can come into you. Uh, that's the only thing I can figure out. I have, you know, you know, something drove me to do this. You know, the normal people just don't do this. You can't stop it. I can't stop it. It's just, it controls me. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's like it's in the driver's seat. However, in 1979, one person had managed to escape being tortured and murdered by the BTK. Anna Williams, aged 63, had returned home later than usual after hanging out with friends that night. The BTK in his confessions later stated that he waited for her, but as time went by, he grew impatient and left. This made him absolutely enraged because how dare she evade him. In the years that followed, he continued to murder three other people, Marine Hedge in 1985, Vicki Wedgerly in 1986, and Dolores Davis in 1991. In those two decades that he was on the murdering spree, the police had recruited more officers into the task force to apprehend him, but were unsuccessful in finding him. Then, for over a decade, there were no more murders. The people thought that he had either passed away or was locked up for another crime, and the local police force had considered the killings to be a cold case. But in February 2004, after 25 years of radio silence, the BTK had resurfaced and started communicating with the television station KAKE, and yet again he started playing the game of cat and mouse with the police. He started sending enclosed photographs of his victims and photocopies of their driver's licenses, and this went on until January 2005, when he had placed a cereal box in a pickup truck at a Home Depot, but that box was discarded by the owner and when he asked about his latest correspondence, it was found in the trash can. A CCTV recording at that location showed the image of a man driving a Jeep. He sent more boxes, and one of them contained a bound doll meant to depict the murder of the young Otero girl. In his letters to the police, he had asked if communicating via a floppy disk was untraceable. The police the next day responded in the newspaper that yes, it was an untraceable means of communication, and he believed them. The police found a deleted file, and the metadata contained the words Christ Lutheran Church, and it was last modified by a Dennis. A quick search online had led them to Dennis Rader, president of the church council. They had finally found their man, but they could not arrest him with only circumstantial evidence. 
They needed to compare his DNA to the ones left behind at the crime scenes, and if they drove up to his house to arrest him, they were afraid he might escape. The police obtained a warrant for his daughter's test from her doctor's office and did what could be explained as a reverse paternity test to the sample found in the crime scenes. It was a match, and now they had what they needed to make an arrest. When the detectives finally captured Raider, he couldn't believe that it was over after 30 years. It came as a huge shock of disbelief when they asked him, Are you BTK? Yes, you guys know. Well, say, say, say who you are. BTK. You're BTK. The confessions came as a shock to the officers and the press, and he shook the nation with confessing to each and every crime he committed, in which he said, need to find out more information. On that particular day, the 15th day of January, 1974, can you tell me where you went to kill Mr. Joseph Otero? Mm, I think it's 1834. Uh, Edgemore. All right. Can you tell me approximately what time of day you went there? Uh, somewhere between 7 and 7.30 this particular location, did you know these people? No, that's, uh, no, that was part of my, uh, I guess my, what you call fantasy. These people were uh, selected. All right, so you, you were engaged in some kind of fantasy during this period of time? Uh, yes, sir. But who was the BTK killer? The BTK killer, also known as Dennis Rader, was born in 1945 in Pittsburgh, Kansas. He grew up in an ordinary home, but would go on to develop violent sexual fantasies that involved bondage, but he maintained the perfect image for the all-American boy. He would go on to join the United States Air Force, then get discharged, come back home to marry, and have two children. When he was arrested, he confessed to killing 10 people. He pleaded guilty and started to describe the details of the murders with no remorse and no apologies. He was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences, with a minimum of 175 years. A Massachusetts psychologist, Robert Mendoza, was appointed by the court to evaluate Raider, and he diagnosed him with narcissistic, antisocial, and obsessive-compulsive personality disorders. He observed that Raider has a grandiose sense of self, a belief that he is special and therefore entitled to special treatment and a complete lack of empathy for his victims. Dennis Rader is now in solitary confinement and will spend the rest of his days in prison. Which other stories do you want to hear next? Leave your suggestions below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more extraordinary stories and click on the bell button to get notified.